I love you all. Welcome to Revive Church. I love each and every single one of you all. Thank you all for being here. And um, to all of our first-time guests, we love each of you so much, and we are so happy that you are here. One of my faves is here, Deanna, and I love her. And her fave is here, Jalen. It's good to see you guys, and um, we love you both. All right, let's all stand and get into it. We are in a new series called Transitions, and it is not the typical transition you are used to. It is in, uh, re involving um, the supernatural of God um, being manifest here on earth because we are called to live in that. And the people of the Lord said together, amen. We are called to live in that, and we are called to make manifest um, his kingdom here. That is what our assignment and our objective is here. So let's go to Isaiah 64, 1 through 4. Isaiah 64, 1 through 4. If you are first time viewing online, I love you so much. Do me a favor and share this and press the heart and the love button um, to our online campus. We love you guys and thank you for being here. Isaiah 64, one through four. You got it? Are you sure? As I drip water and have a hole in my mouth. Isaiah 64, one through four. Ministers, I see you all, your little heads are turning. It's so cool. Can't wait. Isaiah 64. All right, let's read uh, together. Um, let's read this together, all right? Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down and make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you, do, when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. I want to preach from this subject, God benefits of an open heaven. You may be seated. God benefits of an open heaven. Father, we love you and thank you for all that you are. Thank you for doing something special in our midst today. We promise to give your name the glory for it. Father, without you, I am nothing. With you together, we are everything. And I honor you for your presence and your anointing that comes to destroy yokes, even for this moment of preaching and teaching. In your name we do pray, amen. Someone say that real loud. God benefits of an open heaven. Y'all, it's so good to have Ain't Step back with us. I hear it back and say, but my Ain't Step. Um, Isaiah, as we know, was considered one of the major prophets of the Bible. Uh, of course, we know the major and minor prophets. There's no difference other than we have more record of one than the other. There's no levels to them per se. So Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet who had a strong and deep desire to be close to God. Uh, is there anybody else's desire to be close to him? Being close to him is the best place to be. Um, to be honest, it's the only place to be. And um, Isaiah had the desire. His also, Isaiah's also desire was to, I feel like I'm talking about my son Isaiah, but you, we, we know you love God too. Um, he desired that heaven would be manifest on earth. That was his desire. His desire was to see heaven manifest on earth, and he was a prophet that always foresaw what was to come. He saw Jesus before he ever arrived. That was very important for us to understand, all right? He saw this man named Jesus, all right? And I want to ask you all a question. Have you ever felt like God was far away from you? Does anyone know what the distance of God feels like? Where you believe that he is far away, but he really is quite close. But something has convinced you that he is not as close, although he really is. I want to ask you, what in your life right now has you thinking that God is not close to you? I love to see the wheels turning in the room. And I love also awkward silence because it makes you reflect. Is that breezy? Oh, hi, breezy. See, moments silence calls you to reflect. What has got you believing and thinking that God is far away? 
yourself, situations, things you willfully put yourself in, problems, circumstances that you may have, yet and still, he is close. I want to tag this on to something I recently discovered last week that I challenged our ministers on to see if they could find. And we'll review that in our class later. However, there is a book, a man, by the name of John, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 3. This is a very common scripture, often read at a service called a funeral service. It's typically when the preachers and the other pastors enter in the room and the ministers, and they say, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe within God, also believeth in me. For in my Father's house there are many mansions. For if it were not so, I would not have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you must be also. You know, you, you've heard that before. I, I did good, right? This, this is a very, and you all know that from what? A funeral service, right? What if I told you that that scripture had nothing to do with heaven? Mama Sharon's going to get me after she, mm, you got to talk about this with me. In my father's house, there are many mansions. For if it were not so, I would have told you. John chapter 14, verse 2. Every funeral you go to from now on, you're going to hear the scripture and be like, um, I'm going to prove it to you. It's fine. Wait. This is having to deal with, of course, we know Jesus going to heaven, going to prepare a place for us. But here's my question to you. If he is, in the early Old Testament, it's identified him as the maker, the creator of heaven and earth. Why does Jesus have to go back to heaven to prepare something that he already made before we were ever born or existed? I can see you're still puzzled. Wonderful. Let's do some Greek and Hebrew studies, shall we? If you look at the proper context of this scripture... Jesus is consoling a weary disciple who is really sad about him leaving. He is, begins to encourage them, letting them know in this how it should be read is that let not your heart be troubled because although I'm going away, you're still going to be with me. But it's not in, in, the, dis, in, the, in the premise of distance, it's in the premise of dimension. Now, to understand this, let's go even further. The Bible says that in my father's house, there are many mansions. That word mansions means dwelling places. This is the place where one dwells. Stay with me. We'll go somewhere. It means to remain in a place. It is the same thing by the Greek writers, listen, who used to connect tents of soldiers who pitch their tents while they are marching from one place to the next because they understand they are not called just to one area to fight. They only pitch a temporary tent because they know in the morning there shall be another place they are called to go to. There's a place for you in my father's house, many mansions. There's a place for you, the Bible says. It means a spot. It means to be, listen to this, this definition it means to be limited by occupancy, to have a covering of something sharp. Now, if this is your description of heaven and where you're going to go, a very sharp, pointy place, then sure, keep that translation in your brains. However, when he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, he's not talking about physically, I got to go get, pick up some wood at Lowe's and get some nails and a hammer and a saw and some, uh, a nail gun and build something for you because I did not prepare for you. He says that if I don't leave you right now, I am the missing piece to what you need to know that you can always stay with me, although I'm not physically here anymore. So, and if you look later in the chapter, in John chapter 14, let's even read this. Turn, open your Bibles, because y'all still don't believe me, and that's fine. 
John chapter 14. Let's keep going. Remember, they said, he said, I'm the way, the truth, life. I'm, I, you know the place where I'm going. They said, well, master, we don't know the place that you are going. How do we know where you are going? How do we know who is the way or what is the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's going to make sense in a minute. No one comes to the Father except through me. Listen to this. If you really know me, you will know my Father also. You see the context a little better now? Keep going. From now on, you do know him because you have seen him. And Philip, another curious one, said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? He's asking to see the Father. Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many mansions. Philip says, well, how do I know I've seen the Father? He says, do you not know me? Because I am the Father. And when you look at me, I'm not only a man, I am the Father. And the Father has many dimensions to him that you can dwell in. So although you're sad, I'm trying to rescue you and pull you up to a place of sonship that you can always dwell with me regardless of what's going on. I'm not going away. You're coming where I am. But why would we, now here's the other question I want to pose to you. Why would we have to wait until heaven to get close to him when there's plenty of scriptures that say that we are his sons, we're seated in heavenly places, we're already there with him, he sits closer than any brother. If that's the case, then why do we make this scripture about heaven when in reality all he was trying to do is that although you got a taste of heaven, you can always experience this if you choose to dwell in me. One got it. Thank you. This is the place I want us to get to. That we're always dwelling with him. Which means, Kaylee, we can always experience heaven regardless of what's going on. They were sad because they were losing the physical manifestation of God. But never realized there was something even better coming after he left. Which if you keep going, in chapter 14, he promises them a comforter. The Holy Spirit. One who will come and dwell within them. So why was he sending that? Because that was the access point to having him all the time. <laughs> so Acts chapter 2, when, the, when we shout about Pentecost on the day, when they were in one, on one accord, suddenly a sound came from, you know, have a clothing tongues on the head, and we shut da 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 all, all that stuff. When the Holy Spirit came, I had a conversation yesterday, it was never about speaking in tongues. We make it about that. It was about being a sent one to a place or to a country or to a people, to a community. So when you have that, it was sent. Now after Acts 2, they started doing crazy things, miracle signs and wonders that no one has ever seen before. Why? Because they finally learned how to dwell. But it, was until, it wasn't until God left them physically that they were, able, they were able to understand they always had them all along. When they found out he was always there, the door unlocked, the heavens opened, everything began to be revealed to them. And now you see great people like John, who was a forerunner of Jesus Christ. And you got John the Baptist, and you got Paul, his great conversion from Saul to Paul. And you got a Peter who would walk in shadows, would heal people, make them fall out. These are the things that happened after they realized all it took was for them to understand he never was leaving. Why does this make sense to now? Because you cannot properly comprehend open heaven unless you are already realizing you have access to it. So the whole point for me giving you that as my introduction uh, was for you to understand you have access to every single thing I'm about to talk about to you. But you have it from the aspect of, listen to me, you don't have to work for it. You just have to dwell in him. Dwelling in him grants you access to every single thing that heaven has. Again, remember last week I told you all that if you're living in lack, let me, let me put a, 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 a little slide on that. If you're living in lack on purpose, then you're making a bad embarrassment of the father because the father owns everything, which means you have access to everything. So there's a reason why you may not have anything there, but the truth of the matter is, are you still dwelling in him? Can I tell you a real truth? Psychologically, this is proven. When you don't have anything, uh, there could be any food, any money, a car, a house, whatever it may be, you can literally feel a, 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 like an oppression on you. 
when you don't have. Um, listen, listen, let me prove the point, all right? How do you feel if you have $500,000 in your bank account? Look at y'all, all y'all's faces changed. What if you had negative $500,000 in your bank account? All of your faces changed again. You see how money just did something different? What if you had a 14-bedroom, this eloquent, with a, with a center, uh, with a beautiful living room that was like almost two stories, and you had a beautiful big backyard, a three-car garage, and you had several others in your carports in the back, and you had a man cave or a woman cave, a little woman little area underneath the house, and you had all these beautiful huge bedrooms with a spa tub and, and the shower, and, and you had a big old huge walk-in closet that was as big as a room full of shoes and clothes and everything you wanted. You know, some of you all are smiling, and that's good, but what if that was taken away from you? And your face changed again. The premise of this is, when you don't have, you feel inadequate. But just because you don't see a physical manifestation, listen to me, of what you want does not mean you are without. What makes you without is your mindset you take on when you run out. Jesus, the Lord is Christ. So I want you to understand, although you may not have a lot, it still is understanding you have so much. And until it manifests, you are required as a kingdom citizen to behave as if you are living in that place. If you're dwelling in the one who has it all, why are you acting like you're dwelling in the one who doesn't have anything? Oh, bless the name of the Lord Jesus. So let's read Isaiah 64 and let's understand what we're about to have. This goes for anything. I'm not just talking about one thing in particular. I'm talking when you, are, when you lack one thing, when you've had a relationship in your life all these years and you have nothing, you feel inadequate. When your job gets taken, you feel inadequate. When your car breaks and, and the bill is way too much and it's to someone, you feel inadequate because something you're used to having is not there. Something the Lord told me earlier is that he was dealing with and coming for the comfortable places in our lives. Where you've always found comfort at. Because some of you all, when you don't have it, it's easy to retreat back into something you're used to. When things are going good, oh, you're good. You're like, hallelujah, shandai hamanda thataya. And you're really good, hallelujah, bless you, brother. I mean, you're real good walking like everything is good. But the moment that something is taken away from you, oh, buddy, how you doing? I'm fine. Why are you growling at me? Hey, how you doing? I'm good. No, you're not. <laughs> I'm all right. Why are you yelling at me? But when everything is good, let me ask you, how, how well are you? How able are you, shall we? How willing are you? That's better. How willing are you willing to allow God to balance your emotions? Because looking at some of you all in the room, I can see you like this. You just, some of y'all are like, Pastor, I'm trying. I'm, I'm, some of y'all are like, oh, I'm good. Hallelujah, Shabbat, praise the Lord, Barak. Hallelujah, I mean, you're from your fine, but then some of you are like, I'm just, I'm coasting, I'm all right, I'm okay. Some of you are like, bro. <laughs> but when do we get to, talk to, talk to you guys last week, when do we get to the place where everything around us, nothing affects us because we're not living and looking here? Living and looking here will always have you on a mood swing. Living above has you consistent in everything of your life. Again, like I always say, does it mean you can't be human? Not at all. But your moment should not override the beauty of God and the goodness of God. Shall we scream for 10 minutes and then go home? Let's try it. Number one, these are the God benefits of an open heaven. Number one, God dissolves immovable difficulties. God dissolves immovable difficulties. God dissolves immovable difficulties. In the chapter, chapter Isaiah 64, 1, it says that the mountains would tremble before you. Verse 3 says, you come down, you came down, and the mountains trembled 
before you. And that word tremble here in Hebrew means to shatter, means to dissolve, that when the heavens come down, the mountains dissolve. That means that you will always know when God is present, moving through you, when every time you walk, mountains begin to shatter right in front of you. It means you have the ability, listen to me, it means you have the ability to speak to something bigger to you and instantly watch it tremble. To be honest, I want the kind of power that when I step foot on the grounds the mountain is existing on, I want that thing to bow at the name of Jesus because all of heaven and earth and authority he's given to me as well because we're joint heirs with him, right? So that means we have that same ability. I want that kind of power that when I show up, he shows up as well, and every mountain has to bow before me. Why are you distracted by something you can dissolve? Number two, God removes dead areas in our lives. Mm -hmm. God removes dead areas in our lives. God removes dead areas in our lives. Verse 2 says, and when fire sets twigs ablaze, he means that he's going to burn up the bushwood. This means that any dead vines, anything that was tangling that thing up, anything that was trying to coil around the neck and trying to suffocate the life of that thing was going to be burned to uh, and never be able to be raised again. That's what God's trying to do. Uh, can I just do this real quick? Lift your hands. Just trust me right here. In the name of Jesus, may that spirit of Leviathan uncoil from around you and may you begin to be able to live and to breathe and may every dead thing that does not belong in your life anymore, may it suffocate now. May it burn by by fire. May you have grace to finish this year. Grace to finish every assignment. Grace to move. Grace to shift. Grace to live. In the name of Jesus, let's shout amen. Number three. Sometimes, only thing you need, you're not possessed, you're not going through a midlife crisis, you're just been, you're being tangled up. That's what it is. Sometimes you feel like life being, is being taken out of you. Maybe you're dealing with the spirit of Python. Maybe something's trying to coil around and have your neck real stiff. Have you, have you ever woke up like that? Like, oh my gosh, I'm not sure what's going on. It was not the way you slept. It was the way that you allowed that thing to coil around you in the midst of what you were going through. Number three, God restores our zeal. Number three, God restores our zeal. God restores. Verse two, and calls the waters to boil again. <laughs> the Bible says in the New Testament to stir yourself up by praying in tongues. It causes something to boil. Have you ever been somewhere in your life and you've been feeling like, oh, my gosh, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on with me, what's going on? And then all of a sudden, you feel this God tugging on you. You feel God just like, it's like, okay, Lord, is this the wrong time for this? I'm trying to work. I have things to get done. Anybody else in the room? You just, you just, you're on the bus. <laughs> just like, and you're just over this. Oh, I'm so Oh, just thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. I mean, you're just good. You run out of soap in the shower because you are just so full of the Spirit. I mean, you just get out, run out of lotion. You just keep lotioning yourself over and over and over again because you forgot you did it already the first time. You're just so caught up. You can't. You get in your car and tempted to go to the store, and when you get to the store, you are all wonked out. Just something is just overtaking. You can't get out of the car because God is pressing on you. Can I tell you the reason why? It's because God is trying to restore your zeal. He's trying to bring back the the burning again. He's trying. God can do anything with the burning one. One who's always lit on fire for him. And I believe that's what God's trying to do. God has you sitting still right now so he can make you burning one again. He has you silent right now. He's trying to make you burning again. Yes, you don't have a lot of things to do. He's trying to make you on fire again. And that feels uncomfortable when he does it. But it's so worth it in the end. Verse, no, I'm sorry, number four, God brings victory. Maybe I can shout on that one. God brings victory. God brings the victory. Come down and make your name known to your enemies. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Have you ever been, like, about to fight somebody? Maybe you're about to get, like, smoked out. 
and uh, you went to fight and was like, hey, well, don't make me hit you. It's like, yeah, do something. Whatever, I'm doing. And then you say things like, I'm going to go home and get my big sister, my big brother. They're going to wear you out. And they will respond saying, go get them. I can beat them too. And after I get to beat them, I'm going to beat you too. You know, you've heard it before, right? It's not that your enemies, listen to me, doesn't know him. But it's just something when someone who's stronger than you shows up. That you feel a confidence you've never felt. And the good thing is, you don't even have to clench your fist. You don't have to lift a finger. You don't even, you don't, you don't want to even break a nail this time. No mark on your face. Why? Because he's the one who always brings the victory. And he's coming down to make himself known. It's not that your enemies don't know him, but when he shows up, there's a certain kind of reverence that comes upon them. And they can't move the same way they thought. They had all that map before, but they have not met the power of the Almighty God. So thanks be unto to God who always causes us to triumph and because he has the victory I don't have a reason and because God is the greatest power we shall never be defeated y'all acting real chocolate Catholic and Anglican mixed together today that's cute number five our vision is enlarged when the heavens begin to open vision unlocks for you Verse 2, the latter part of that, and cause the nations to quake before you. Nations. 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 Which means it's bigger than just you. It's bigger than just you. Where you are right now, it's bigger than just you. Who in the room is called to nations? You know you're called from somewhere else other than the United States of America. Thank you. Who else? Don't be ashamed. Lift your hand high. I know you don't want to go over there, but you got to. <laughs> I know, but it's, you're going to do it, so it's fine. This is what is, is important for you to understand. Where you are right now is, let's just say, um, an eye exam. God is trying to get you. Mm -hmm. He's trying to get you to understand that if you open up wide and receive where you are, you'll be fully vested for when you go over there. Here's what I mean by that. I just had this happen this last week. Have you ever went to have your eyes examined and they, and they dilated your eyes? The un, most uncomfortable thing. And as soon as you see light, you're just like, hey! like a vampire. And everything about you is just all messed up because it's just like, it's just so hurtful. And that's where some of you are right now. You can't see real clear. You're trying to ask God why and when and how and where and what, and he's not answering. You're trying to pray and get an answer, and it's just not coming through. God said, I had to dilate you so you can stay inside until your time has come. And if you can just hide yourself under the shadow of his wing, you will see him do some things in you you have yet to see before. But until but what he has to do is position you under him so when he releases you, you can ensure that you are presenting him in the right kind of way. You cannot bake a cake outside of the oven. You have to just trust his cooking. <clears throat> Same thing with you. You can't see everything God is doing. All you know is you were obedient and went under. And while you were under, he's developing you. As a photographer, something that I, re I never want to involve in is dark room where you have to go and put the film inside. You take the picture, but you never know if it came out right or not. You never know if the focus is on point or not because you can't see the product until after it's been processed. You don't know exactly how the exposure is until you develop that thing and watch it go through. And you take the negatives into a room and they, and they give you something positive. You can't see the process in the dark room is what I'm trying to tell you. All you have to know is that God is processing you. And I wish you, there was somebody in the room who will understand that God is processing you. I know it's uncomfortable. I know it doesn't seem 
right. I know it feels, hey, you don't know what's being taken. And the stuff that you love to do, you can't even do no more. Why? Because God is developing you. And when God's developing you, he has to put you through a thing called the bath, which means things got to wash off of you. He has to handle you a certain kind of way, which means the friends you used to have that's not even, not even around for you anymore. People you thought that was always going to be there, it's no longer there. They used to have answers, and now they're always complaining about you and your, your moments with God and how God is using you. They're jealous of you, all these things. But eventually, when you come out of the room, you are a beautiful picture that no one ever expected to be. Can I tell, share with you something? Don't allow people who are jealous of you when you come out of that room don't allow them to make you go back into the room and turn into something negative. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see you in the room. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) I see you. Don't allow people who don't understand your process or not called to your process, not designed for your process, not assigned for your process. Don't allow them to make you something you're not called to be and push you back in the room to become a negative. Negatives are always saved, so they're easy to go back to. Y'all are young in here, so I'm not sure if you remember the, the camera you had to press the button turn the shutter you would take the negatives to them but when they got done they would give you that little spool of negatives back listen man so in case that you lost what was processed you can go back to what was not finished yet hear me and hear me well don't you go back to that spool of film trying to become something that God never called you to go back to. Don't open that thing. Hey, develop these again. Let me just look at them one more time. You're developed now. That's a word for a lot of you all. You're developed now. E-D. Past tense. You're developed now. No one appreciates the beauty until they see it hanging on the wall. And then when they see you hanging on the wall, it's too late now because now I'm on to a different season. I feel a pull on my back. So because you are in a different season, that means that you should not allow people to have the same access to you. You always find yourself frustrated when you bring old things into a new thing. God never said, behold, I do, I do unto you a new thing. Bring in the old and keep it and move it into the new and it will transform. No. Behold, I do unto you a new thing. Shall you not see it? Which means you have to be pointed a certain way to be able to perceive what he's trying to show you. Which means there is no word in that scripture that makes you turn back to look at something. Fix your eyes. Regardless of what's going on. Fix your eyes. Amen. I got off of point five. Let's finish verse of point six and seven, shall we? The impossible becomes possible. When God has an open heaven, in verse three it says, you did awesome things that we did not expect. Which means, you all, that God is doing something you cannot perceive right now. He is working some things out for you that you cannot comprehend right now. I said it while I was singing, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and what? Called according to his purpose. If you would simply understand that God, what God is doing is bigger than you, you will understand that you don't have to be God. Praise the Lord. I love this scripture most in the Passion Translation. So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan 
of bringing good into our lives, for we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. Everything is being woven together. So when we say that God's doing the impossible, he's taking what you don't deem is necessary and making it necessary. Beauty for ashes, sorrow for joy, mourning for dancing, These things that he's doing because it's an open heaven. Everything becomes possible, which means you're going to have to work on your faith game. Because without faith, you can't even see the impossible become possible. Have you ever been told no a lot of times? (laughs) And somehow that no became embedded into your brain that when you even got a yes, you still heard no? Can I help you? Prophesy to you even? Ask God to deliver you, hear me, from the trauma of no. If not, when you do hear a yes, you will still think it's no, because for you, you have resulted and resolved I'm always going to get a no. The worst thing you can do under an open heaven is to make an illegal covenant because something didn't go the way you wanted it to go. It's always going to be this way. It ain't never going to change for me. My family's always going to be this. I ain't never going to have this. I'm always going to be here. These things, man, one of my most hated statements ever It is what it is. I hate that statement. I feel like a demon says it when someone types it or says it to me. I want to poke someone's eyes out. (laughs) Nicely, with loving kindness. (laughs) Have I drawn thee to poke your eyes out? Because it it is a statement, man. That, that is, I feel like it's the ink, the dried ink on a contract that says, I'm willing to set up for whatever. Who cares? And every time you do that, you make a mockery of the God in you who's trying to get you to understand that although this is not going through, something else will. Pastor Hart Ramsey, I love him. He said, he, we all was on the call with him, and he said that he has been trying to get this property and this loan for like over 10 years. And all he's heard for that time is no. He has great credit. He's not exhausting his credit lines. Everything's paid on time. All is good, fam. He kept hearing no, 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 no. He said, I wanted to give up. I wanted to stop. But I said, you know, I'm going to give God another shot. I I can believe again. I'm going to believe again. He did. He got a call in the middle of our meeting, clicked over, came back and said, y'all, I just want to give y'all this testimony. I've been dealing with this for over 10 years, and I finally just got the call that it came through, and I'll go sign the paperwork on Monday. Oh, look at y'all. Just, ooh. Vicky, Vicky, Vicky. I mean, some of you all are missing this simple fact that when God does it for somebody else, it's available for you too. And so it's not the fact that because it happened to him and he's in another state and he's not nowhere near me. I don't even know. Y'all, y'all, don't, y'all don't even know who he is. It doesn't matter. It's the simple fact of that when you're under an open heaven, everything that you deemed impossible becomes possible. And it may not happen in the timing or the way you thought it was going to happen. All your testimony is, is God did it. Regardless of what happened or regardless of what you did not see, the testimony is God came through one time for the one time. And I can just give him praise on that period regardless of what's going on in my life. If he did it for somebody else. And of course, we've heard if he did it before, he can do it again. He's he's the God that can come through. He always, you're never going to let, never going to let me now. We sing it and it's cute. But I can tell by a posture of you that you feel like God is not willing to come through. Or this is hard for you to understand because you've always heard no. If you ask God to break you out of that posture, you'll be postured to receive what you think is impossible. I am a witness of that. 
all of us, all of us. And I'll say this, and I'll, I'll say my last thing. Get your pens ready to write number seven after I say this thing. <laughs> and even if God does not do it, that does not change his goodness. Look at y'all manifest. But I want him to do it, and I, just, I feel like I deserve it. Who are you, spirit of entitlement? You prideful devil to make God like he should work for you when we are, we are seeking him. It doesn't happen the way you thought it was going to happen. All you know is God comes through. Last one, pen ready. God moves. It's going to, this is going to offend some of you all and bless the others. God moves on behalf of those who wait. I heard someone say, my Lord. God moves on behalf of those who are willing to wait. Ask someone, how was your waiting game? Ask them again, what are you doing in the waiting room? I went to the doctor last week, and in my conclusion, I went to the doctor last week, and I was sitting there, and I was like, bro, David Simmons, all right, I'm ready. I, mean, I was just sitting there for a long time, I was like, bro, ain't nobody here. There's nobody in the waiting room. Why am I waiting here? So I get up and get a tissue, sit back down. Get up and get some hand sanitizer, sit back down. Kick my feet because I'm short and sit down again. <laughs> and then she walked out and was like, Mr. Simmons. It's like, yeah, yeah. You're upset because you don't see no one in the waiting room. But you fail to realize everything is occupied right now. But if you learn to wait for the opportune time, God is clearing space so that when your name is called, you get all the attention. I went in the waiting room, and all of like all the nurses, and all, they were just right there. I had, they didn't have to be juggled. They had my attention. God is trying to do that same thing to you. If you just learn to chill, pick up a magazine, go to the vending machine real quick, keep your mask on, and just learn to wait until he calls your name. I read that in a different translation in verse 4, King James, which we know, the world not heard nor perceived by ear nor hath seen what he hath prepared. For him, New Testament, eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men what God has prepared. See how Isaiah was always looking ahead. But Isaiah mastered waiting on him until the right time. These benefits that I'm talking about under an open heaven is not something that I want you to walk out of here Walk away thinking that like, oh my gosh, I got this. These seven things are cool, but now I gotta like, I gotta all these things. I'm, I still haven't seen it. Can I be very honest with you? 2020 was never about the year of vision. Still trying to figure that one out. I legit had to like, I typed, this is dumb on someone's status, and I had to delete it. Because it wasn't my place to say that. I had to repent. So I did. It's being honest and transparent. It was never about the year of vision. It was about the year of exposure. Maybe it was about the year of vision. Maybe we just, we just we thought we were going to be looking ahead 
and not looking at us. Perhaps. It was just about the year of getting you together. We'll see a bit better in 2021. But this year was never about the great things. Now, I do believe those who are postured correctly are prospering in the pandemic. I am one of those people. You are too, in Jesus' name. Y'all just so defeated, Jesus. And here's what I want you to understand. As we are in this whole transition series and talking about this open heaven thing, I want you to understand, listen, the beauty of the open heaven is for you. Not for him. It's for you. And everything you have, you need, you have access to. Don't allow your condemnation to make you feel as if God has forgotten about you. Don't allow your chains to keep you stuck in one corner and you're just wishing you can get to the promises of God. It's not worth it. We messed up this year? Yeah. Had some things happen we didn't expect? Heck yeah. But who is willing, regardless of what happened this year, to still say, God, it's the 10th month. You have two more months, two and a half, to make something happen. So I'll give you these last few days, and I'll just trust you with the rest of it. Can I tell you one of the biggest decisions you can make the rest of this year is to stop being God. Hit you, didn't it? Just hit me too, like a sack of bricks. Stop being God. You don't have to have control over everything. You're not him. You don't have the strength he has, Breezy. You were sitting back there in the dark, but I could, this is a big old light on your head. You don't have, you don't have that authority. No. No. But if you just learn to trust him, man. It'll all work together for the good. But you have to relinquish your name tag sticker that says, hi, my name is God. (laughs) Reminds me of the episode of the Golden Girls when they took the name tags and put them on the Kim Pong toy. (laughs) Man, it's a beauty when you're willing to rip off false name tag to submit to your identity and let him take the rest of it. I wonder who in the room is willing to do that. In my father's house, there are many mansions. I know we're going to have a lofty conversation in our class. In my father's house, there are many mansions, many dwelling places in the father. I wonder, will you be willing just to go, seek out, explore, see what God has? I'll just mention seven things according to Isaiah 64. There's plenty of other things you can choose from. And the Father is unlimited. Have you ever been to a mansion before? It's huge. You walk in, a castle. You walk in, hello, 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 hello. Like Karen Clark Sheard. I'm like, you're not alone, you're not alone. Hold your hand, hold your hand. Oh, who are you? <laughs> it's endless possibility. You could sleep in this room today, sleep in that room tomorrow. Why? Because <laughs> there is no limits in him. We let religion believe we can only have a portion of God. And thinking we have to wait until heaven to get the rest of it. This is what that scripture is saying, man. You don't have to wait until you get there to access him. If that was, if that, listen to me. If that was what it was, then what was the cross for? What was the veil being torn for? So that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. So if I'm waiting for heaven, you're missing a lot of things. Endless possibility. So when someone says you can't, let's show them that you can because you have the greater one living on the inside of you. 
and greater work shall you do. That's also the Bible. So let's do it. But you will never see the greater works of God until you realize that there is so much more you can explore without limitations. There is no limit. The only limit is what you've been taught. I remember Aunt Step. I don't know if you remember the same step when we were Connect Church. This is my real conclusion. Sorry, I will. I'm just like a Baptist preacher. I got to have 15. Aunt Step came and she was like, I think it was me, you, and I think Mama Sharon, I think you were around in the vicinity while she was talking way back when at my house. And Aunt Step was crying. <laughs> and I was like, why are you crying? Who did it? She's like, I've been in church all my life. And I've never heard the gospel as simple as this. I didn't even know this stuff was as simple to get. I didn't know that this was just, I didn't know that this was, this is what, it's, the sim, it's simple. I've been in church for years, and I never knew this stuff. Am I telling the truth, thanks, Steph? She was crying, just, <laughs> she was just saying thank you, is what she was saying. It's not because of me. But listen, man, when you understand and hear sound truth, it'll unlock a world of revelation for you. And it unlocks a level in God you never thought you could have. When you just know the truth of him. That's why the Bible said that it's, un, it's as unto a little child. That's how the gospel is supposed to be preached. Not at face value. There's something more to it, yes. But man, when you got it, you got it. And because you got it, now you have the proper understanding of what God really wants to do in your life. I'm not just saying it about this scripture. I'm thinking about several other things that church has always taught us, like cleanliness is next to godliness and, you know, <laughs> things of that nature. Things that's just not in the Bible. There's so much more to him, man. There's so much more, but you've got to be willing to be unlocked in the areas you locked up because your great, 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 or your old faithful or lethal loyalty to a, to a pastor has taught you just to hold on to this truth. The devil is a liar. There are things that I have unlearned, several things I've learned from when I grew up, and I'm thankful about it. So I'm thankful for a place to worship where the gospel's being preached, wherever you belong to. Let's hold on to that. And if there is an area in your life that needs to be unlocked, ask him, Lord, give me, reveal to me the truth. Reveal to me the truth. I used to think that you had to speak in tongues to go to heaven. Where is that in the Bible? It's not there. I was like, Mom, you got to get back to the Holy Ghost. You ain't going to go to heaven. Ah. Someone asked me a question one day and said, so someone who is, or you have to be baptized in Jesus' name, that's another one to go to heaven. She said, so someone asked me, she said, so someone on their deathbed is immobile, can't get to a pool. They go to hell because they weren't baptized? To my dumb self. I said, yeah. because I was taught incorrectly. Ruined a person's life, perhaps, because she couldn't make it to the water to be baptized. I repented once I came into greater truth. That was never in the Bible. But because I trusted a man to teach me, I put it in here and called it the word of God when it was incorrect. The best way you can experience an open heaven is to experience real truth. Let's all stand. Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for what you have shared with us today. Lord, cause it to stick that you would get the glory from everything that was rendered unto you. Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you that you make all things new. 
Thank you, Lord, that open heavens. Heavens are unlocking over us everywhere. Mm -hmm. Heavens are unlocking. I decree it and I declare it. Heavens are unlocking. Places in our lives that we never thought would be unlocked are unlocking. Will you just worship him for the opening that's happening over your life? Father, thank you for opening things up for us. 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 Father, I bless you for it in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's thank the Lord for what he has done. Amen. Amen.